today I've got a special guest on. She founded this dating app you guys might have heard of called The League. Back in, I think, 2017, I like requested to be on this app, and it was super exclusive, and I didn't get on. I was on a wait list for like six months, but all of my friends who went to really popular colleges all were on this app, and now you guys know that I've been talking a lot about college and whether or not I think entrepreneurs should go to college, specifically because I didn't go, so I'm really fascinated by how dating works as well as how these apps have really taken over dating in general. So Amanda's here to talk with me all about how she got her star as well as how she founded The League. But before we get into it, make sure to follow This Is Life Unfiltered on social media. It's at T-I-L-U podcast on Twitter and at This Is Life podcast on Instagram. And then myself as well, which is at Alexa underscore Curtis. So Amanda, thanks for being here today. Thanks for having me. I'm excited. Well, take me back from the beginning because you went to college and you currently are dating somebody who you met on The League. So you guys, this is like very legit. But tell me, t- <laughs> take me back. We call to- it dog fooding in the industry where you use your own product. No, I think it's fantastic <laughs> because I've never met, I've never met like a dating app founder, but specifically wouldn't think that any of them would be in relationships because they'd all be way too busy focusing yeah. on the dating app, not the dating. But tell me about... Yeah, the cobbler's son has no shoes. Right? Yeah, literally, exactly. <laughs> but take me back from the beginning. So like, let's start with when you were in high school. School. I mean, what were you like? What were your interests? Yeah, so I I did weird things in high school. I think um, I was one of the first people to buy a CD burner, and I would burn CDs for my friends with different mixed songs. And it was back in the day where you had to you know download the songs on Napster. You guys probably don't remember these days, but you'd have to wait like an hour to download each song, and you have to be pretty like kind of geeky to to know all the software to use. So I would sell those for ten to twenty dollars to my friends these mixed CDs. And then the other thing I did was I loved making these friendship bracelets, these super intricate friendship bracelets. I would spend, you know, hours on the weekends working on them in between. I played volleyball. So in between volleyball games, I'd be like doing my sewing and then I would sell them for five or 10 bucks. So I always liked creating things and selling things. So I think you can get, you know, started with entrepreneurship as early as high school, even, and just see what your classmates are wanting and see if you can, you know, make t-shirts, create CDs, whatever it might be. Um, so that was my high school. What's your family background? We were, um, my dad worked at IBM and then a bunch of startups when he was kind of in his thirties and forties. So we lived in California, then we moved to Texas, then North Carolina. So I have, he was a, you know, super, super geek, I guess you could say. We always had the the newest BlackBerry device or the newest, you know, back before the iPods and the iPads, there were these Newtons and these Palm Pilots. And so we always had all the latest gadgets. And I was always the first person on, I think I was on CompuServe, Prodigy, AOL. I met my best friend on AOL BuddyChat, which was kind of the Facebook before Facebook. You could search for people. And I was moving to a new school and I searched for the middle school name. And then I found a bunch of people on AOL and just started, like I messaged first, I started being aggressive from a young age at building my network. Um, And so I remember I I moved to North Carolina in eighth grade and I had all these AOL friends waiting for me. Like they, they, uh, my mom was so surprised because on the first day in North Carolina, uh, like two parents came by to drop off their kids to play with the internet Amanda. Oh gosh, I don't know if this is good or bad. Is this like internet safety? Like what a one? Who is this internet Amanda coming and internet Amanda's coming? And so I had a, uh, yeah, I, I definitely leveraged social networks from a very young age because I thought it was so cool that you could kind of create friendships and get to know someone without having to be in the same city. And I wanted to have friends. I really wanted to have friends when I moved to this new city, and I did. So I, I love, I'm always a big kind of fangirl of social networks. I love Facebook. I love Instagram. I love just ways you can communicate with people. I love dating apps just for that exact reason. When I was in high school, I was such a weird kid, even in middle school, but I was always so fascinated by like relationships and friendships. So is there something that really got you interested in that topic when you were younger or did you not find your interest in kind of the whole dating thing until you got older? It was more, I mean, for, for me, it's always about solving a problem. So my problem was I had, a, I had moved and I had been really lonely when I moved to Texas because I didn't have friends and I, you know, sat at the lunch table by myself and I, when we moved again, it was kind of a second shot at getting to, to move to a new city and actually do it right. And so that was why I was so, 
uh, kind of fanatical about getting on AOL and making friends on buddy chat. And so I think the same thing, you know, I, I think I believe in, in using technology to solve problems. Same with the, the mixed CDs, I guess, you know, I wanted a mixed CD of these 10 songs. I didn't want to buy 10 CDs and, and change them throughout my, my speaker system. So I think it's, it's always about how do you leverage technology to solve your problems. I mean, in, in college, so I, I, I did go to college and I met my first boyfriend, kind of Sears boyfriend in college. And I remember it was my sophomore year and I had met this cute guy my freshman year during orientation and I never saw him again, even though my campus was super small, 4,000. Um, you just don't, you know, if you're busy, I was in sports, I was doing a million things with my friends, your paths just don't cross. And so I, Facebook had come out right uh, in between like freshman and sophomore year. And so I remember my mom was like, you should practice having a boyfriend, Amanda. I mean, you're, you know, you're cute and smart and like, just, just try it. It's just something you should, you know, have an experience. And so I was like, well, what about that guy I met at orientation a year ago? And so lo and behold, I stalked him and found him on Facebook, sent him a message. We started talking on Facebook and then, you know, we, he came and picked me up from the airport after Christmas break and we started dating and then we dated for four years from that day. So I, again, it was like solving the problem of like, okay, let's try having a relationship in, in college and then leveraging, you know, social networks to, to find people that, that are interested in the same things you are. I'm trying to get an idea when you were in middle school and high school, were you more of like the nerd? Were you like the popular one? Were you the one in between? I feel like I had a lot of friends in all those groups and I was kind of like the nerd in, I was in the wild group though. We, I liked trying new things. I liked going to parties. I liked, you know, I threw a big party at my house, uh, my freshman year and my dad's Palm Pilot actually got stolen. Um, so I remember getting grounded for that, but you know, I, I like to experience a lot of things. So I did, I would say I was definitely more in the, the group that was outgoing and, and very social. Um, but then I also was, you know, studying a lot. All my volleyball teammates would make fun of me because my, my head would be in the books trying to get good grades on all my AP scores and I wanted to go to a good school. So I think I was kind of like a hidden nerd. Um, and, you know, I liked I like having fun. So I like uh, I like making people laugh. And so I like usually being in in big social environments. Yeah. So Amanda, you're in your thirties. So you, yeah. you're early, very early thirties. Don't guys. remind me. I know. I know. I, but I, I feel like I'm in my twenties. That's why well, I like you look podcast. super young when she first came <laughs> in the room. I was like, Oh my gosh, you look so young, but you have been then kind of at the forefront, right? Of all of these apps from when Tinder started yeah, to like, I feel like I'm at the beginning of the dating revolution. I was there. I and was like you there. were at the beginning of AOL and MySpace. <laughs> yeah. So what have you seen when you were in college specifically? Like you went to Stanford, Carnegie, no Carnegie Mellon. And then did so you I went to very, the Carnegie Mellon's like a very nerdy, but, but super smart school, but it's it's full of really people interested in technology, and so social networking was a big thing for us. And what was the dating situation there like there? Okay. <laughs> it was like, go to frat parties, people got drunk at frat parties and maybe made out and then didn't talk to each other the next you know couple months. What and were then, you trying to study when you were there? Um, I studied computer science. Oh my gosh, so, so you were like very yeah, like so I was tech. in the super tech circles. I ended up switching into information systems because because I liked the I liked the designing and the building the experiences and doing more of the front end um, kind of front end of the website experience and computer science ended up being like almost all math physics and back end uh, back end information so um, I switched over into information systems and then that's where I learned how to build websites learned how, a lot about databases and really gained all the skills I needed to to build my own company I ended up leveraging them you know in in my 30s it took me 10 years to kind of figure out how to use my major but but it, it definitely helped me with learning how to manage all these engineers and building technology um, but dating was non-existent on campus I think we were such a nerdy campus that it was um, you almost had to use these you know Facebook to, to talk to people and so I think Facebook was you know really changed the social fabric of college and I got to see it one year before it came to college and then the three years after and you know it, it was night and day how how much more coordinated and more kind of social and integrated the campus was afterwards. I've been talking a lot about college and whether or not I think that entrepreneurs or young entrepreneurs when they ask me should go to college because I specifically didn't go but I stand firm on still thinking that every young person should go because a lot of people are still trying to figure themselves right. out even when you're in the initial phases of your startup. So do you think that college played a role in what you've managed to build or no? I think I think I agree with your perspective in the sense that if you know exactly what you want to do and you know, um, let's say you're Taylor, little Taylor Swift, and you know exactly what you need to do, I don't think you should go and 
and spend four years not doing what you think you were meant to do. But I, I think the issue is most of us don't know what we were meant to do. We don't maybe know what you're good at. You don't know what you're not good at. And so I like to think of it as a four-year trial period where you get to know what are you strong at, what are you weak at, what do you love doing, what do you hate doing. Um, and then at the end of it, you kind of take inventory and hopefully point yourself in the right direction of a career that you'll eventually find your home, right? So I think it's it's a very expensive learning pen, play pen. Um, so I, I'm a big fan of going places that give you scholarships. I went to Carnegie Mellon partially because they gave me academic scholarship rather than spend a ton of money on some brand name um, school that doesn't give you, you know, a scholarship. So I think it's, it's less about the brand name of the school. And I know I sound ironic because the league is very much have, have people from brand name schools in it, but I, I think it's a lot about what you're going to get out of the experience and what you're trying to learn and learning about yourself. And yeah, maybe it makes sense to go to a brand name school. If you know, you want to be an investment banker and you want to go to the top investment bank, then, then it makes sense to go try to get into an Ivy league school. But if you want to be a musical theater and you want to study it, you know, community college down the road might have an awesome community theater program. So it's, I think it, it is about understanding yourself. And if you don't know yourself well, I think college is a great place to find it. I also feel like going to college helps you just experience this kind of new side of yourself, right? And I feel like college is where the whole hookup culture started, it's true. which is what so many people know about dating apps, which is what I found about so different from the league is that the whole concept of like hooking up versus really talking to somebody, that's what the league is about. And that's what Bumble really has made more possible is women being more forward. Right. So when you're on a college campus, do people talk to each other? Because I didn't go to college. Right. So sometimes like at a community college, uh, and I'll go on campuses or something, and people don't really talk at community college, but it seems more clicky at the bigger colleges like the Carnegie or the Pepperdine. Right. It's. I mean, it's interesting. I think there's, cer there's certain... One thing that college does well is create social environments to meet people, right? So there's fraternities, there's sororities, there's sports teams, there's... You know, you can be involved in the yoga group, the musical theater group. So I think it's... There's a place for you to find people that share the same interests as you. Um, but that's really what we're trying to do with the league. Ironically enough is that we're trying to create those same interest groups on the league so that you don't need to go and pay, you know, for my, in my case for graduate school is almost a hundred thousand dollars to, to go in and find these people that share like-minded interests with you. Right. So instead, if you can find that through an app or through kind of the social networking of today, I, I don't, you know, you don't necessarily need that in college, but I think, the point, I guess, that you're making is that I think college does provide this infrastructure layer of meeting people, and then, then there's safe places to date, whereas in the real world, you know, you go to a bar and maybe no one talks to you, and you're like, well, where am I supposed to meet people, <laughs> right? If no one's talking to me here, you're kind of forced to go to these dating apps. So there, it is a lot more organic in college where, you know, you go to a party, and for the most part, everyone there is single just because college is really where, where most people are single. How much has social media played a part in dating? Like how much has back in 2001 where somebody would go out to a bar and talk to somebody and now it's like I go out to a bar or I go to a restaurant and everyone's on their phones. Right. I, I mean, is this a healthy culture? I mean, you run a dating app, yeah. so this is like your life. But I mean, is this a culture that's we're headed in a good direction or are we like all kind of screwed for people who are single and haven't met their boyfriend on the yeah. league yet or girlfriend on the <laughs> league? Well, I mean, it's funny. The I think there was a quote from these bartenders or bar owners in Australia that were saying since Tinder, since the Tinder revolution, um, sales have been way down at like comedy clubs and just at overall like nightlife because a lot of people are are just going out for dates now because you're kind of setting up the dates and then going out to places r rather than trying to find people. Um, in, in the actual environment itself, like in the wild, right? So so people, I think, are, are doing like pre-screening pre and pre-setting things up. So I think it's totally changed the dating culture. I don't think, I think most people are scared of rejection overall and dating in the wild means you have to go up and ask someone two questions, both are you single? And then if you're single, are you interested in me? And so there's like, you know, double rejection potential. Whereas on a dating app, you get rid of that first layer. Everyone's single who's on it, theoretically. And then the second one is you don't get to see if they're rejected. I mean, that what Tinder does and what we do and what Bumble does is this double opt-in where um, you're only matched if both people like each other. If the guy, if I like the guy and he doesn't like me, I don't find out about it. So my feelings aren't hurt. So it's this culture of, of kind of uh, becoming a little bit maybe more sensitive of a culture because we don't get used to like, rejection. And so I do think it's unhealthy in the sense that people sometimes then get really, um, they don't know how to handle rejection and they get very upset or emotional or they take it very personally or they get attacking or, you know, so you see these stories of people that freak out when, when they're rejected by, by someone 
Um, when really that's, that's what dating is. It's, it's the act of rejecting most people. <laughs> Somebody has to reject the other person and then, you know, you're only going to end up with one or a couple of people for the rest of your life. So in reality, getting good at dating is getting good at rejection. Yeah. So I think it, I do think it, it doesn't strengthen that muscle for people very much dating apps. For those who are listening and might be curious or might be not on the league, might be on Bumble or even Tinder, what separates the league from every other dating app out there, specifically Bumble, which is where women are now encouraged to message message the guy first? So we're designed for what I call the overly ambitious. So people like you guys here in the room are, are the perfect candidates. Um, I, I wanted to use a different social network than Facebook because I felt like people, at least in my demographic, weren't putting a lot of information on Facebook. Facebook was starting to lose popularity when I started this in 2014. Um, I didn't put where I went to school. I didn't put my job. I, what I did do, though, is I did have a LinkedIn, a really baller LinkedIn uh, profile because I was looking for jobs. I was trying to network. I was trying to um, do business development for, not for my company, but for another company that I was working for. I was getting business meetings. So I felt like LinkedIn had a much better representation of kind of who I was as a professional. And I wanted a ecosystem or a community where people where work was their passion. And I don't want to call it a, I don't want to call it a dating app for workaholics, but we have been called that. Um, but I, I, you know, it is for people who are career focused and care about that and want that in a partner, right? So you're not going to be turned off if your girlfriend or your boyfriend has to work late or is traveling around the world trying to, you know, start a company or a podcast. And I think that, you know, some men were intimidated by that or did, weren't looking for that. They were looking for a different type of, of woman or girlfriend. So um, I really wanted to, to use LinkedIn and to have more of an admissions program, kind of like a college would, where you're, you're trying to put people into this community that's balanced. There's a diversity of backgrounds, a diversity of people, um, of, of what their jobs and their industries are, and then hopefully kind of meld together like-minded people that can find each other that maybe aren't finding each other in the everyday world. Before you started the league, you said you worked two corporate jobs. Yeah. So you're in college. You go for a four-year college. Yeah. Yeah. And then you started the league after you left. Yeah. So, so I multiple did. No, years I down gra- the road. And then I went to grad school. At Stanford. So I did another, another bout of education um, after my two corporate jobs. And then I left to start um, to start the league right after I graduated. So. Oh, so that's like eight eight years? No. So yeah, that's I like started at years. 29. So, um, but I had, you know, it was scary because you go, I had, de- I had accumulated from college, you know, I was starting to pay back with my corporate job one and two. Those were, you know, well-paying jobs. So I was kind of paying down the debt. And then you go to grad school and then you're taking out more loan. So it's, you're almost going back to where you were. So it's, it's scary because then you are basically betting that you're going to do something cool within your career. Well, you know, do it well enough that you can pay off this hundred K loan that you're taking from the government to fund your education. So it's, you know, it's definitely gambling. It was scary, but I did feel like I would learn a lot of skills around entrepreneurship. And I think the biggest one I, I gained was confidence in being able to kind of walk the walk, talk the talk, go up to investors, you know, pitch them and not feel like I, you know, not feel insecure about it and not feel like I was underqualified. And I think especially for women, um, sometimes it does take, you know, an extra credential here and there to, 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 to get you to have the confidence that maybe other people don't, you know, men sometimes have innately. And I think, um, you know, I, I think about the, some of the connections I made while at Stanford. Those were super helpful in starting the league. Um, but honestly, it's the confidence the walking out of there. You feel like you can do, you know, you can do anything. And I think there, it's a special ecosystem that that kind of pumps you up enough that you feel like you can go and change the world and, and conquer your dreams. And um, so that's that's why I liked, you know, graduate school. And but again, I, I, I'm not one of those people that say you have to go to college, you have to go to grad school to do to accomplish your dreams. But I do think it is a tactic and a strategy you can take to accomplish your dreams. But it, it's not the only one. But I also think that what you studied in college is different than a lot of entrepreneurs that would go on to start businesses because you didn't study business, you didn't study marketing. I mean, you started computers. Right. I wanted to gain a skill that I could actually use to to help me build my business. But right. when you went to apply, you didn't. You must not have thought, oh, I'm going to start a dating app. No, you no, didn't think of that. I didn't. So where along the line did that come? Because you you worked two corporate jobs, right? And, and then was, it was, they were not in dating; they were in software sales. And then you <laughs> left all security to start a dating app. Yeah, well, I I was single, so that was my biggest. Like I said, I like to solve. Um, I like to use technology to solve my own personal problems. And my personal problem was I had gotten out of a five year relationship 
at the end of my business school stint. So that was really scary because I was 29. All my friends were getting engaged and married and everyone, it seemed like, was in a relationship. Uh, I was newly single and everyone at business school had already kind of coupled up. So my immediate you know, social circle did not have any viable candidates for me. So I was starting to go on these dating apps and I was getting more and more frustrated and disappointed with how much work it took to even understand if this person lived in the city, if they had a job, were they living on their parents' couch, were they selling drugs? Like half the time they were just in town for the weekend and you know, from two hours away. And so there was no accountability or authenticity on these apps. So I wanted, that's where the kind of LinkedIn came in because I was finding myself using Tinder and then I would look for one clue on the Tinder profile, which would be like, okay, he has a shirt that says Duke. So then I'd be like, okay, Mike, Duke. And then in his profile, you'd say he's a lawyer. So then I'd be like, Mike, Duke, lawyer, LinkedIn. So like like internet like, stalking, like, like what I do. Oh yeah, yeah. Like, like what? I, how I found my other boyfriend. Um, so I found him on like page ten of LinkedIn, and it was kind of clicked in my head that I was like, why don't we just integrate with LinkedIn and have it so that Mike Duke from lawyer, Mike Duke lawyer, has to actually put that information in, and I'm not having to go and vet, you know, make sure that people are who they say they are. So that was really what. What kind of, uh, I guess, made the light bulb go off in my head that I felt like, let's just integrate with LinkedIn, let's integrate with Facebook, let's make sure people are who they say they are, and then I don't need to go back to graduate school, for instance, to meet more, you know, smart, ambitious men. I can put them all in this community, and then we can, my friends and I can all, <laughs> can all kind of fish from a, a pool where people are exactly what we would have seen in graduate school without having to go pay and apply. So we always joked... You know, a lot of the girls are like, should we go back to business school just to like, because the dating was great there. You have 300 people. They're all like super accomplished, smart. They want smart women. The guys do. And and so it, it is this like awesome dating experience. I think we had 30 couples from our class get married the last couple of years. So, I mean, out of a class of 300, that's like a crazy percentage. So, you know, it, it, there's something about kind of putting ambitious people together that, that worked. And so I was like, let's just do that. But digitally, um, and I was also for me, like I wanted it to work for me, right? I wanted to find my, my soulmate, my, um, my partner. So it was, you know, I kind of had a dual interest in the terms of solving my own problem and then also making it easier for people, you know, for my friends. I had a couple of single girlfriends and we were all like, when is the league? They're all like, start the league, start the league. So I had a kind of a whole cheering section at graduate school of people that wanted to use the app. So I felt very, I guess, empowered going into starting it. Most of the entrepreneurs that I talk to all say something similar along the lines of they're fixing their problem they can't f- right. solve for themselves, which is dating or had somebody else who's the founder of a really totally. big bra company. And she said the same thing, but there's something um, kind of similar ab- about all of you guys is most of you have left these secured, phenomenal corporate jobs to start and have no security. Use right. all of a lot of the times your savings from these big corporate jobs. I mean, what's your one piece of advice for somebody who might be listening who is is in the same position or maybe younger, a little bit younger, but still working that corporate job, but it's just like, screw it. I really want to leave, start my own thing. But how do you switch your mindset to be so comfortable with having now no security? Yeah. I mean, it's scary, especially at a place like Google, which is where I was, where, you know, you're getting this awesome free food every, every day you're getting stock options that pile up your, you know, every, everything there is really provided for you. Laundry, uh, you you know, extra classes to learn things. I mean, it's, it's almost like being in college again. Um, so I think depending on, you know, but, but I also think you, it, it's great to experience those things so that you know what you're leaving. I think what I find is that people who've never worked for anyone else before have a hard time understanding what kind of the real world is like and what, what a real company functions like and how, how it works to have a boss and how to be, be managed and manage other people. So I, I think once you've learned enough and you feel like you're kind of, you've stopped learning, the slope of your learning has, has started to plateau, I think it makes sense to think about what else, what else you could be doing with your time because your time is so valuable and, you know, life on earth is short. And I always say, you know, what else could you be doing if you only had 10 years left? Let's say you're going to die in 10 years. Is this really what you want to be doing right now? And if not, how do you get closer to, to what you want to be doing? So I tried to really take take that kind of mindset. And I was, like I said, I was 30. So I felt like that was a really good, you know, I had spent 10 years of like learning, learning how the world worked and understanding technology and, and these big corporate culture. And then I wanted to spend the next 10 years trying to see what it was like to, to build my own 
company and maybe I wouldn't like it. Maybe you would, but I think you, you know, you always got to try to know, and then you find out a lot about yourself. And there's a lot of people that go into entrepreneurship and say, this is terrible. I don't like it. I would much rather work for someone else because of X, Y, and Z. There's a lot of reasons that, 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 that makes sense. You can actually get paid quite a lot more when you don't work for yourself. It's very rare that you, you know, that you get paid more working for yourself. You have to really have all the stars aligned. So, I mean, there's a lot of reasons that, you might not want to go into it, but I think you don't know until you try. When you were working at Google, it seems like you almost felt like maybe you hit a wall or like you just wanted, quote unquote, more out of life. I mean, would you say that that's kind of what you felt like when you were there? Yeah, I think I looked up to a lot of the, you know, I looked up to a lot of the super successful women and found that a lot of them actually had MBAs. That was what got me started thinking about getting an MBA was that these women I admired, a lot of them had that credential from these great programs. And then, uh, I think the other thing was just when, you know, the bigger the company you're at, the the harder it is to, to move up and to get more responsibility and autonomy. And I really wanted to, to know what it felt like to have a lot of responsibility and to have that autonomy. And now that I have it, I'm not sure I like it that much. I mean, it's, it's scary to be in charge of a lot of people. And there's things that I, you know, expected that I would like and be good at that, that I'm not. But now that I've but, but when you're at a smaller company, you, you get to learn that and you get to experience that. So I think I was just ready to, to try my hand at, you know, managing people, having, you know, authority over, over big decisions. And when you, you know, at the bigger company, sometimes you don't get that. So I think it's just about looking at how much kind of extra learning you're getting per year. And if it's starting to stall out and maybe the ladder's too high for you to climb at that certain place, maybe it makes sense for you to jump ship, go to a smaller company or go start your own. Yeah, the um, league I read online has brought in over, so you guys are getting a sense of especially how big and booming the dating industry is. I think it was like two point one million over in seed funding, which is yeah. So we raised a phenomenal, about two and a half, phenomenal. Yeah. So when you were in this corporate job, did you start the league as the side, like a side hustle, or did you like leave and? I mean, what was the first step in between yeah. leaving corporate and, and doing this? Well, so I left Google. I went to business school, so that was a two-year program. And then what I did was I had about a semester left to graduate, and I kind of skipped a lot of my classes that semester because it's you know it's a little bit of your last semester. It's not that big of a deal. Everyone's kind of checked out anyway. It's like it's like college when you're a senior, senior slump or high school. Um, and so I started working on it while I was at Stanford, and I was going to go to another big corporate job after business school to help pay off my loans. Um, I was actually going to go work for Facebook. And um, so I accepted the job. I was going to start. And then I kept pushing the start date out because I was working on the league as my side hustle. And then I thought really hard about going to Facebook and keeping it on the side. But at the end of the day, I gave myself a couple milestones. And I said, if I can get the if I can get the app to have this many users, if I can talk to this many investors, if I can get this, you know, this many people to commit to giving me money that I'm not going to take this corporate job. And so that's the way I always tell people who are, are in jobs today is like, give yourself milestones for your side hustle, do it as a side hustle, but give yourself milestones. And then when you hit, you know, when you hit the milestones, hold yourself accountable to saying, okay, now I'm going to do it full time because I've, I've sort of proved out that there's a business here. There's an idea here that, that is good. So you had started that as a side hustle. Yeah. I mean, I think I started it. Yeah. While I was at, you know, doing another, doing something else full time, I was getting my degree full time and I started on the side because I wanted to, to know, I didn't want to go a long time without having income. So I was trying to minimize the amount of time uh, I was going to be going without getting, getting a salary. So that must've been so scary. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's gotta be because I never worked corporate. It's almost like I've kind of now gone backwards with a new show <laughs> that's corporate, but I mean, that's what I find. Now you're getting a sense now I'm of getting it, right? A, I, I, having a, no comment. Parents. It's not, it's weird. It's weird. It's odd. Tracking your hours is yeah. so weird to me. Why somebody would like track their hours and not just be paid a set <laughs> fee, like for the work this that you good. do. This is good. See, now you're learning what you like I'm and le- don't yeah, like. Yeah. What right? I like. Another. But, um, I mean a lot, the biggest issue that I find with a lot of aspiring entrepreneurs and maybe when people reach out to you, it's a common thread is that no Nobody knows what the first step is. Right. So whether you're working corporate, whether you're in college, I want to know what the first step was when you you had, I mean, you have to come up with a name. Totally. So you came up with a name. So I came up with a name and with then the help of my friend Mariano. What yeah. do you do? <laughs> he like, likes me to say that. Okay. Um, but so, okay, what I, here's what I did is I looked at all these accelerators, right? So there's a lot of incubators and accelerators that will take startups and they're almost like going to college for startups, right? And you have to apply to get into these programs. 
So what I did is I looked at all of the application requirements. It's like make a two minute video, write a one page executive summary on your business, paragraph on the problem you're solving, a paragraph on the market opportunity. It'll basically tell you in these applications all the things you need to build. And if you go to like three or four startup sites, I think like Y Combinator is a good example, AngelPad, Stanford had one called... um, uh, Stardex. So you go and you see all these requirements. And so I just built the materials they were asking for. And that's step one is like, okay, make a two minute video about what the fuck this business is. Um, you know, make a, make an executive summary about how you're going to make money. And so it kind of forces you to put pen to paper and start thinking about it. Um, and then what I did is I applied to all these incubators and I got rejected from all of them. Um, and then the next step is not to get upset and to see if you can handle rejection. So rejection. Yeah. Um, and a lot of people just stop there, right. And say, okay, I didn't get into these incubators. And so those are the people that are not cut out for entrepreneurship because that means there's going to be a lot of rejection in the next few phases of, of the process. And so you can't even deal with getting rejected from these, you know, schools for entrepreneurship, then you're probably not going to be able to handle it when people all turn you down when you ask them for money. Um, so then I got rejected from all these things and I said, okay, so I got a professor of mine to say, to kind of hold me accountable. And I did an independent study in his class and I said, I want to make sure that I am making progress. Will you meet with me every couple weeks and check in on it? And he was a professor of entrepreneurship. So I checked in with him every week and I actually, what I did was there was a class that happened at Stanford that, that went through this process of the lean startup methodology. And so the first thing you do is you get, you do a focus group and you get people in a room and you ask them, um, different questions about the product or service you're trying to build. You get, you show them a prototype if you can build it. So I would go to, um, there's a site called Basalmic and you can make wireframes of like just black and white sketches, super easy of like, here's the first screen. It would have these buttons and then, you know, what, do you like it or not? What, if not, what do you, how do you feel about that, you know, this product or service? And so you get to do all this user testing. And so I would basically just, I followed the curriculum of this class that I didn't get into because I didn't have a strong enough startup pitch, I guess. And I just did it anyway. It's kind of like auditing a class that you don't, you know, you don't make it into. And so I went through all those motions and then I just went, took one foot, one foot after another. So then once I had a prototype, I then started to look for developers that could build this prototype because I had all these screens in, you know, on paper and I could show you did this all on your own. Yeah. So I I, I don't like working with people. So (laughs) I mean, I like working with people, but I don't like having to, to, I like being able to, to get my vision, um, executed. And sometimes when you're trying to work together with someone, you spend a lot of time back and forth on small decisions. And I wanted to just move super fast to see if the, if the project had legs, because if it didn't, I was going to go back to my cushy corporate job and try something else. So, um, I created all the wireframes, started shopping it to developers and getting quotes. How much would it cost to build this? How much would it cost to build this? Talked to a bunch of people, finally found someone that I felt like I could work well with. Um, he took direction well, but he also had great ideas. So we were collaborative Um, And then I just got it built. And so we started working in June and we shipped the product in November um, on the App Store. And that was when we launched. Then we got a TechCrunch article written and it was just me. It was literally just me. And then he was a guy I hired. Um, as a developer and it was just us two and then we people we started getting users and people started telling their friends and then all of a sudden we raised two million so it all kind of the ball starts rolling but at the beginning it's just putting one step in front of the other and doing you know doing the the different pieces of work that that kind of gets you gets you to a point where people can get feedback and then start to use the product how many years do you think you dealt with rejection like how much did rejection because rejection is like 99% of I feel like what how you get to being somewhere how I've gotten yeah. to where I am is rejection how much has that played a role in maybe making you stronger or making you like more cutthroat I yeah. guess yeah well I think you have to be you have to be really committed to to your vision and you have to trust your instincts and if you think this is a really good idea and you have Maybe you're not great at, maybe I wasn't great at positioning it or selling it or getting people to understand what I had, but I knew, I knew in like my heart, I guess, that, it, that I had a good idea and I had, I had something there. So I think it's, it's about sort of withstanding the social pressure that says, oh, this isn't a good idea. This isn't a good idea. This isn't a good idea. It's easy to just say, yeah, you're right. Okay. These smart people told me it wasn't a good idea. Um, and it's about believing in yourself and really seeing it through. And maybe you're wrong, but you know, at the end of the day, you're wrong, and then you, you learn, and then um, that, that's how you learn. So, the, I mean, I think rejection is a healthy part of that because it helps you learn how to trust yourself and whether you're right or wrong at the end of it. Um, being able to trust yourself in spite of rejection, I think, is 
kind of entrepreneurship in a nutshell. How did you even come up with the name The League? I didn't even ask you that. Yeah. But that's quite different. That's two words compared a, to most yeah. apps that are one syllable. It's a good It's a good name because I think it, it, it stands for a lot of things. So I played sports all through my life. I was a big volleyball player um, in college I played. And so I always felt like the type of community that the sports people always had, like whether it was in college, whether it was in high school, just all the athletes that were playing in these – these sports leagues had had this kind of like-minded, very competitive spirit, and and I wanted to kind of represent that in in the app that I built. Was that these people are very ambitious and they're all trying to make an impact, and it's it's kind of like being in this league. Um, the other, there's a lot of other reasons why I think you know Ivy League is is we weren't we did start with a lot of Ivy League people. I started with like Harvard, Stanford, and Wharton as my kind of core core users that started and while it wasn't designed for Ivy League educated people I think that it did kind of concisely get the idea across that people from Ivy League schools were were on this app right this is a platform that you know well educated ambitious people were using and then the other piece was like kind of a joke but you know you're dating dating in your league so it's like let's let's find people that you don't want to settle for right so we one of our taglines is never settle um, but you know date someone that's in the league you want to be in and whether however you define that but you know for me it was I wanted to date someone super ambitious that wanted to be with um, an ambitious person I didn't care how much money they had I didn't care what profession they were in but it was about having that kind of drive and that just ambitious nature and that was that was like the kind kind of common thread I was looking to to draw in this community and people that that either were ambitious or felt like they were ambitious or want to be ambitious and it's a kind of vague ambiguous term but I, I like it because of that because I think you can be ambitious in a lot of different ways and it's not it doesn't always show up on your LinkedIn resume but I we try to help people make sure it, to kind of use the right language so that it does. You know, if you have side projects, if you're working on a nonprofit, if you're volunteering somewhere at a local high school, like put that on your profile because I think these are all characteristics of, of what make people so awesome that might not show up on their, you know, on their resume at first blush. This might be a weird question, but would you then consider Bumble and Tinder and all these other apps out there, do you think people on those apps are not ambitious? No, I think it's just, to me, that's like, it's the melting pot, right? Those apps are the the Walmart in the sense of like, Walmart has awesome, super like the high end products and it has, you know, has products from all over. And I think, I think for us, we have, we're, we're a lot more narrow and targeted. And I think the people who join the league are looking for relationships, are really serious about their career. They're very passionate about their career and they're career oriented. So I don't, and I don't know, that's not always the case on Bumble and Tinder from what I found um, but but that's not to say those people aren't, you know, I think they say average person uses three to four dating apps at a time. So we're not trying to pretend that, you know, our users aren't elsewhere or other people's users aren't on our our app as well. But I just think it's it's for us, it's just making sure that when you're on the app, like I always say, you might see the same person on three apps. But what I hope with the league is that the interaction feels different. It's kind of like you met at a, you didn't meet at an all you can drink bar in Cancun, you met at a dinner party that's talking about, you know, economics and you're at talking about politics or, you know, there's, there's a much more intellectual vibe going on in the league. And I think people kind of brush up for that or sometimes don't, you know, uh, hold themselves to a higher standard of writing back and making sure their messages are clever and interesting and showing off that they're intelligent, whether on some of these other apps, you might just say, what up? The league is also <laughs> unique in the sense that you have a waiting list. Right. Are you, can you disclose how many people are on a waiting list at a time? Cause this is a dating app and you guys are that exclusive. Well, the waiting list uh, serves a couple different purposes. So one it's, you know, it makes, it makes sure that the people who join are there for the right reasons. Like people that get turned off by a waiting list, don't want to wait in line. They must, might've been there for a one night stand. They might've been there for just to poke around and window shop and see what was up so it it kind of prevents a lot of the the bad actors that were just trying to tire kick um and the other thing it does it helps us make sure the the ratios stay balanced so like if there's a lot of girls that sign up for instance they might be in line longer than the guys um the guys get in faster sometimes on the league which is ironic because we have slightly more women than men that sign up um but it helps us keep the ratios balanced and we have about half a million people on the waiting list today that's insane. Yeah, I know. But do from you, all over, all, all cities. Do you sit there and you click, like, accept? And I, I mean, I, at the beginning, at the very beginning, I did. I was the original bouncer, but now we have a whole team and we have algorithms that help us, like, shortlist people. And you can tell when people, you know, filled out their whole profile and actually edited it versus the people that just 
blow through the application process just to see what's in there, right? So you can almost tell by the behavior of users who really is wants to be there and meet someone and really wants a relationship and who's just trying to I always say check out the talent and and you know they're not they don't spend the time crafting a profile and then we look at and then we actually have humans that look at people's profiles to make sure we're not overlooking anyone because algorithms sometimes can look over overlook people and then we also make sure that we help people that maybe aren't putting their best foot forward and we say hey your profile is great, but your photos, you know, frankly, are terrible. Uh, here's some we recommend, and we'll actually kind of put them on hmm. on a timeout until they get their profile up to date. So we try to help people. You specifically mentioned Harvard as one of the schools that you first went and kind of attacked to get people on. Yeah. What was your plan of attack? How do you do? You walk up to somebody on campus and be like, "Hey, I started a dating app. Get on it." So we, well, I started in San Francisco, which is where I was living, and kind of, I did that, except I did it with alumni. So I did it with alumni from schools that I had a friend who went to Harvard. I asked if they could invite five people to a focus group. I had a focus group with, you know, those people, asked them to invite friends, then had a lot of events. So I actually did this talk at um, HustleCon about all the events we did prior to launching the league, and I think I did a 400-person MBA mixer for like 28 year old to 32 year olds and it was from five different MBA programs and I just got them all to a bar gave them an open bar happy hour which people like by the way um, and open bars are good way to, to get customers and then you know they all told friends so it's all about kind of getting it is about getting in front of people though face to face it was never you know I don't think I could have launched the league had I not met people had I not gone to millions of coffee dates and gone to um, you know, created focus groups, created, I went, we did a fleet week party with 300 people on a boat and sold tickets against that. So, I mean, we did a lot of in-person events and what I always say is like hustling is a big part of entrepreneurship and that, that period was like all hustling. And putting more money, it seems like you did, for example, with an open bar, you have to put money in to be an entrepreneur right. with your company in those initial first startup years, right? Totally. Then you're going to, then you're going to get point. out. Because a lot of people will come to me and say, Hey, I want to start a business, but I can't find investors. And you know, before you start a business and before you find investors, um, I always ask, okay, how much have you invested in this company? And oftentimes it'll be like under a hundred bucks or under five hundred bucks. And you know, if you think about it, it's like, okay, how much did you spend on your last vacation or your last spring break or your last trip with girlfriends to Vegas? It's usually more than that. And if they've not spent more than what they've spent on their last vacation on their startup, then they don't really want to, to make it happen. They're not really putting their money where their mouth is. And so uh, for me, you know, I had to spend money out of my own pocket to hire this developer. He was expensive. Um, then once I got him starting to build this product, and it was an expensive product to build, I think I was paying him four grand a month maybe. So it wasn't crazy, but it was a lot for me um, it was out of my pocket. Then that was when I started getting traction on these investor conversations because they saw that I was going to build a product regardless of if they came in to help me. And I'd already spent, you know, 8K or 12K um, on building this product. It was going to come to life regardless. And I think people want to, investors especially want to see that. They want to see that what you're building is going to happen regardless of their involvement. I've got a few last questions for you. One of them being, I never dealt with investors. I don't know how one deals with an investor. I did one time have an idea for a bra app, and yeah. I like went to start it, and was like, I was like sixteen. It was like a hundred thousand dollars, basically. I mean, that's like it's a lot of money. Yeah. It wasn't that much, but it was like, I mean, when I when you're sixteen, a hundred thousand dollars is like a shit no, ton that's of money. A lot anytime. <laughs> yeah, even ten thousand dollars. Um, but I mean, what's the first step? Because I know a lot of people who listen to this podcast sure. have more consumer based brands, um, or similar to you, or want to start an app. How do you go about getting an investor? And how crucial is an investor if you don't have the money to invest yourself right. initially? And I, I totally hear that not everyone even has the 4K to invest in that developer. So I think the first step is what I did, which was go and build wireframes. That's free. Uh, if you have Photoshop, you can do it there. If you don't know Photoshop, there's all these sites online that you can drag and drop these pieces. And I spent probably like 40 hours building wireframes and like put them you know, about as big as a whiteboard. You put them on a whiteboard. And then you start getting smart people in to comment on it. It's essentially building a product with pieces of paper. And, okay, here's the main screen. When I click this button, you're going to go to this screen. And here's what it looks like. Then you can start to color it in. Then you can actually start to, maybe you have a friend who's a designer. They can help you flesh it out and make it look more real. And then there's these other apps. Um, now I can't remember the name, but they'll actually stitch these wireframes together. And what you can do is, like, my mom, I tested my app on my mom, and she thought it was a real app. But really it was a bunch of screenshots of an app where you, you click a photo, you click a button on the app and it goes to another screenshot 
And so it's almost like it's like basically faking faking the development process. And you can get them really far on that. You can get user feedback. You can talk to investors with it. It feels like a real app because you're clicking and it's going to the next screen. Um, and so I, I say get get that far, and then you really know what your product's going to look like, whether it's an app, whether it's a website, whether it's a social media account. You can start to kind of show what, what that's going to look like visually. And people really like having visual things to comment on, and it really helps get your story across. And that's all free. I mean, I think Basalm is free. Oh, I think it's called Vis- Envision. Is what Envision is what will stitch the, together the little the wireframes that you create from Basalmic. So you can stitch them together, and and then you can start to show people, and then reach out to people. You know, it's people like me. It's people that have started companies. Anyone who's started a company, your mom's friends, your dad's friends, um, get them to give you feedback on that that app that you've built that's just screenshots and and they'll start it'll start the ball rolling they'll tell you someone you should talk to that a person will tell you another person you should talk to that person will say oh we've seen this idea and it didn't work here's why you should go talk to the person who tried it and it failed and then you've learned more and so it's it's just getting getting your idea out there and not being not keeping it secret i would say a lot of people worry about someone stealing their idea and it's usually that's not why ideas don't win it's because you don't execute on them fast enough so investor or taking out a loan if you don't have the money um if you don't have the money so then yeah once you're once you kind of have this prototype that was free to build and you say okay i want to go for it and people are like i I have it then i think it's shopping around for a you know shop around for a cheap and a cheap developer that can help you make this into reality um i think investors are hard to to get at the point of where you don't have a a real product and then if you can get an investor who will work with you with for equity and be be part of the company, or if you um, can find someone that will do it really cheap, um, that's great. If not, and they're charging you ten thousand dollars or a hundred thousand dollars, I think that's that's when you need to shop around, and then that's when you need to talk to people that that have money to see if anyone is willing to to maybe subsidize it with you or go in on it with you. But I think having that information about how much it's going to cost to develop first is key to before you go and talk to investors. How entirely do these dating apps the league included make make money? Because there are you can like get extra like coin like something. Yeah, we have I don't tickets. I don't pay for yeah. the league, but I know, I know. that most it's, people don't. It's most I would say, you know, most of our majorities are are majority of our users are free. Um, a portion of them pay to upgrade for more perks so you can get a membership that gives you more people per day. Um, you can edit your profile and customize it more. You can see if someone read your messages and is, are ghosting you. Um, you can edit, uh, you can actually upgrade to see your stats, to see how you're performing over time. So those are just sort of, you know, what we, we call a freemium model. So most of the users stay on free, a portion of them upgrade to premium. Um, and that's how we mess with We make a large portion of our money and then some people pay an app to see more people so we only show you three people a day if you're on the free version but let's say you're you want to see six that day you're feeling lucky or whatever you can pay money to to see more people instead of waiting for the next day that's neat where do you I envision- like to say we monetize impatience yeah i like that where do you envision the league going you guys put on a lot of events we as do. well which is unusual compared to other dating apps yeah but what's your long-term goal because i mean do you want to be more of a serial entrepreneur and go on to do a new company after this or you think no well, I want to take the league's brand international first. I really feel like we've we've done an awesome job at building a brand that a lot of people know in the United States, and I want to continue to to get out there. I want to be as widely known as you know Bumble and Tinder, even though we are more of a niche demographic. I, I want our brand to to be that widespread. So we're looking at international next year, um, and I think we can offer a lot more products and services besides just dating. Like I think we can offer higher end products. Uh, we sold a uh, vacation cruises in Paris for single people last summer, um, a boat of 70, 70 singles that I took. I was like the camp counselor, uh, or the sorority mom. I felt like, but I, we took them to a couple different cities in France. And so people were paying, you know, three to $5,000 to go on these cruises. So I think, I think the league is well positioned to be more than just a dating app, to be more of a lifestyle brand and, to offer, you know, a lot of different products and services to our user base. So I want to grow that first. And then, you know, I think once we've, once we've achieved the kind of the growth that I think we have the potential to, um, you know, I want to, I want to a do that first and then B C see where we can take it from there and see if we can maybe create more dating apps, more apps, more platforms. I think there's, you know, what HQ trivia is doing is really interesting. We have a lot of ideas internally about, you know, how does video play into dating? Is that through the league? Is that through another league app that maybe isn't called the league? So I think we want to start thinking about horizontal 
expansion after that. Well, Amanda, you are one badass, kick-ass, yeah. I don't know what to consider you, incredible woman who has become so successful with just one idea. That's all it takes, right? One idea and one one match to message back, Very, right? that's, that's my last question for you. For those like me who are listening and are single, and I can't, use, like, whether it's on an app, in person, they just haven't met the person they want to meet. One piece of advice. Oh, man. One piece. I have so much advice. Um... <sighs> I think it's it's be open minded. I think that at least for me, a long a, lo- a long time I spent um, while dating was having very strict preferences about who I envisioned myself with and kind of rejecting anyone that didn't really fit this nice cookie cutter picture of what I thought I wanted. And then I think as I got older and as I dated more people, I realized that 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 I was totally wrong about who I thought I wanted. And and you don't know that until you start dating people outside of of that vision. So I would just say, don't, don't put yourself into a box yet, especially, you know, you guys are, most of you are under 30. I think this is when you should be exploring. This is when you should be dating people that maybe your mom doesn't think you should date or your dad doesn't think you should date, or you don't think you'll maybe end up with. This is exactly the time to be really open-minded and try new things with new people and, and see what, you know, see how that changes who you eventually think you'll want to have as your life partner. Because I always say, like, in your stage, you're basically, you know, in the next five years, you should be building experiences that you're then going to draw from that then when it comes to the the big decision, I like to say. Which is so overrated, um, being married by 30. Yeah. It's so silly. But but as you think about, you know, closing in on, like, okay, who would I want to start a family with or who would I want to end up with, you'll have all these experiences to draw from. And if you only date one person or you only date one type of person for the rest of your life, you'll never know, right? So you'll always wonder, is this person the right one for me? So I would just say, yeah, I guess that's a long-winded answer, but it would just be be open-minded and kind of date outside of of what you think you want. Be fearless. Get out of your comfort zone. Well, I love that. Where can everyone find you or the league on social media? So we are theleague.com on social media as at sign the league. And then I'm just Amanda Bradford. You can find me on Facebook and Instagram at at sign Amanda Bradford. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for stopping by. I hope you guys love that episode. Check out the league. You might be put on a long wait list, but we can give your uh, viewers priority. Actually, ah, how, do, so, how yeah. does that work? Well, so, we'll talk about yeah, that. Yeah, when you log in, uh, you'll you'll get assigned to concierge and just text them uh, ele- hashtag Alexis or friend the VIP. We'll give them a code, and I can tell our team to to give you guys priority review. I love that. All right, so you guys, you can get on the league, right? Well, as long as you're like worthy and feel like you are deserving. Well, if you're to listening be on to this it. podcast, you, I guess you are. Chances are. But that's a wrap. Thanks, guys, for tuning in. Um, I hope you are enjoying the Radio Disney Show. And make sure to check us out on social media as well as give a review or a comment on the app store and the podcast store so I know who you guys want to hear next week. And I'll talk to you guys soon. Bye.